blood vessels in the immune and inflammatory cells. We were talking earlier, and I guess I could carry this analogy even further. We've got the seed, we've got the soil, here's the irrigation. Um, these are the little bugs and uh, bees that um, actually um, create the hospitable environment for a particular plant to grow. And you need these extracellular signals, these distant signals like hormones in order for breast cancer to develop. Without any one of these, you don't have a cancer. You have, you can have the initiated cell, but in the wrong soil, it will sit there dormant for the entire life of a woman. Or if you come in and you block the ability of blood vessels to grow into a cancer, then it will remain a little smaller than a lentil sized cluster of cells that will never grow as long as you don't have the blood vessel. And actually new studies have shown that it's very important to be for these cells to escape the immune system and um, be regulated by the regulation by inflammatory cells. So you need the whole, and of course we've already mentioned the importance of hormones, particularly in breast cancer. So we need to think about each of these components in order to really understand how breast cancer occurs. Let's talk about stem cells. The idea here is that there's been an awful lot of discussion of stem cells in the newspapers and on television. And you might ask, what do they have to do with cancer? Well, it's clear that the mammary gland has a stem cell population. And the way we can demonstrate that is, again, by using mouse models in order to manipulate the host versus the epithelium. So if we take our little fat pad and a young animal before the epithelial bud has actually grown out, um, we can surgically clear that so that we remove the little epithelial bud. And at any point in the animal's life thereafter, we can take either dissociated cells, mammary epithelial cells like I just showed you from the cell culture, or little fragments of tissue from another mouse and inject them into this fat pad and lo and behold, we'll get a full ductal outgrowth. These experiments were done in the uh, 1950s by Ken Diome at the University of California in Berkeley. And they provide a wonderful tool because we can now separate the epithelium, the seed, from the soil and all the other um, components that lead to cancer and manipulate them individually. The way this has been used in, in very recent uh, times is to begin to dissect the signals that allow a stem cell to give rise to a full um, mammary gland. So here we've just indicated a cell. We actually don't have any good markers at this moment for stem cells in the breast or in the mouse mammary gland. But we know from manipulation of the mouse model that there are certain signals like notch and wint that tell the stem cell to either proliferate or self-renew. Um, we think this is important for cancer because of two reasons. One is that the frequency and the regulation of these tissue-specific stem cells are key determinants to cancer susceptibility. So when we overexpress WINT, we actually generate a, a mouse that's more susceptible to breast cancer because we think that it has more stem cells. And those are the targets. There's also a very interesting idea that not only are there stem cells in the normal tissue, but there are also cancer stem cells. This is actually an idea that's been recently kind of renewed. It was proposed in the 1970s by a variety of different groups, but it's been rediscovered and has some very interesting implications. The idea is that carcinogens, such as radiation or chemical, can induce alterations in the stem cells. So what do we mean by alterations? It can be anything as specific as a mutation or as general as a change in its regulation. Um, this altered regulation would just lead to more and more of these stem cells being generated. Alternatively, a stem cell, a cancer stem cell, could actually be acquired through the recapitulation of stem cell characteristics in a cell that's more advanced, so a cell that no longer has the potential to give rise to the t whole tissue. But now, because of a mutation, a change in the genetic sequence that occurs, for example, through the exposure to a carcinogen, actually now expresses that stem cell-like function. So this idea has uh, been brought to light in the breast cancer arena um, relatively recently by a series of studies uh, from the University of Mich Michigan from Michael Clark and Max Witcher. 
So what they've done here is a very elegant series of studies that take advantage of their knowledge of the tissue, of the mammary tissue and tumors, and your ability to manipulate the mouse. So I want to walk you through this. Essentially, they began with breast tumor specimens, right? Some they um, expanded in mice and let them grow so they were a little bit bigger. Um, then they dissociated them into cells. So here our cells are just little dots, and each um, of the cells has um, different colors representing different populations. What they did is use cell surface markers, um, just proteins that are decorate the outside of a cell, to separate this, um, this population of cells into individual populations. And over here are just the markers named CD44, uh, CD24. And so using a particular uh, instrument called a, a flow cytometer, you can sort them on these cell surface markers into the white ones, the green ones, and the blue ones. Then you can take each of these population and inject them into the mammary fat pads of immune compromised mice. Now why do they need to be immune compromised? Because although mouse and humans are similar in terms of mammary gland, they have very different immune systems. And as you well know, your immune system is uh, there to protect you from foreign things, including foreign cells. So we have to use an immune compromised mouse in order for the human cells to grow in the context of the mouse. So now you've separated these um, different population, you inject them into the fat pads, of the immune compromised mice, and you say, well, is it the white ones, the green ones, or blue ones that actually make tumors? So here's um, a schematic, or actually a picture, from their publication that was a couple of years ago, 2003, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Here they showed that the cells that eventually gave rise to tumors looked very different than the cells that, gave, that didn't give rise to tumors. And they compared these cells by taking this population, which they sorted, and this population, and injecting them into the mouse. One case, they made tumors. On the other hand, nothing happened. So both sides of the mouse got an injection, but one side got these cells, one side got those cells. And when you compared the histology, um, actually the, the tissue, um, where the cells that didn't make tumors, which are CD24 uh, positive, there's essentially nothing wrong there. There's no, the tumor cells didn't persist, but these cells gave rise specifically to tumors over and over and over again. So what that actually provides is the idea that in therapy you want to be targeting not the whole population. There's probably a lot of cells in the tumor that are um, kind of uh, passengers, that they aren't really tumorigenic in their own right. They're only tumorigenic in the context of, of that particular population of cells. So we take all this together and ask the question of mice and women, what have we learned? Mouse mammary gland has cell, functional, and tumor characteristics that are very similar to humor. We can take advantage of that because mice can be engineered to now go into greater depth in how a particular mutant protein or mutant uh, gene actually functions in the breast specifically. Um, these, since we can use mice now, we can um, manipulate them a variety of ways. You know, we can combine different epithelial cells with different uh, stromal cells. We can combine different cells, cells with specific mutations, with other kinds of mutations. So they can really begin to test hypotheses about what specifically is giving rise to cancer. And since the mouse mammary gland can actually host human cells, we can also begin to study in greater detail how human cancers and human normal cells behave under different conditions. So a new model that has just uh, been developed by a group at MIT actually creates um, the same kind of model that I just showed you, the, the tumor model, but now with normal human epithelial cells and normal stromal cells. So by using that, we can now um, better understand how those human cells respond to um, exogenous agents like radiation or hormones or a particular therapy by studying this humanized uh, mouse model. So the goal, so, so I just wanted to bring you back full circle to the idea on the one hand, we want to understand fundamental biology so we can better devise strategies to prevent breast cancer. But breast cancer itself gives us clues to how uh, we can now target 
particular therapies based on the individual features of that particular breast cancer. And using these molecular markers and molecular targets that we now see are deranged in tumors, we understand better what controls the um, growth and differentiation of the normal mammary gland. So it goes both ways. Fundamental understanding brings us to breast cancer, and breast cancer also informs us um, to the fundamental biology of the, the mammary gland. So can I answer any questions? Yes. Um, I was wondering if the fact that the, the mouse lifespan is so quick compared to a human, and so the breast development is also it occurs at a much faster pace, would that possibly affect the growth of the cancer, or do you know that cancer grows in a particular way, it doesn't matter how fast it is? So that's a good question. Um, mice, of course, only live two years, and women, on average, live 70 to 80 years. The frequency of breast cancer in women uh, begins to dramatically increase at about 50 years of age, whereas in most mouse models, um, that occurs about a one year of age, which is middle age for a mouse. A woman goes in, enters puberty between 8 and 10 years of age. A mouse enters puberty at 3 weeks of age. So there's a lot of differences in terms of the time scale, but we think that in some models we pretty much replicate the, proportionally the, from, um, the natural history of breast cancer. However, I must say that in some of our genetically engineered models, we sacrifice this... Um, ability to kind of follow out uh, the very long-term life events by creating a genetically engineered mouse that will develop cancer within three months. Um, we think that still represents uh, certain features of the cancer, even though it happens on a much rapid, more rapid scale. And of course, one of the things we benefit from is saving money for the housing of mice. Um, so I think it's a trade-off. In each case, you choose a model based on the question you specifically want to ask. Women have different types of breast cancer, and I was just wondering if your mice experience the similar or different types of breast cancer too, and what are the similarities and differences in it? Well, that's, a, that's interesting. Um, you know, for a long time, um, mouse models of breast cancer were of, actually, well, a long time in the 1950s and 60s, there were mouse models of, of breast cancer that were virally induced, and those tumors that developed from those particular cancers actually didn't have a lot of the features um, that a, a human cancer had. For example, if you look in a rat that's susceptible for, to developing breast cancer, 100% of them will be ER positive. And likewise in a mouse, well not likewise, but interestingly in a mouse, 100% will be ER negative. Now in a woman, there's, or in a population of women, two-thirds are ER positive and one-third is ER negative. So how can we better replicate that particular distribution has actually been one of the major questions of recent uh, studies. And it turns out there are actually a number of our genetically engineered models that actually do replicate that kind of uh, specificity. So one that we're familiar with is actually a model in which this uh, very important gene called P53, we're always so descriptive as, as scientists, um, P53 is a protein that's been called the guardian of the genome. It's supposed to be a protein that regulates whether or not a cell undergoes a DNA damage response or decides to divide or decides to die. And in that model where we've knocked out P53, which is deleted in 50% of all human breast cancers, we get a spectrum of breast cancer that is very similar to what happens in, in women. You get a diversity of histological types, you get a diversity of ER positive and ER negative, and you also get a diversity in terms of the time frame. So just again, depends on the, the model you choose. Hi, could you talk about some of the recent research um, from studying mouse models that's been applied to cancer therapy and treatment? Well, I think one of the best examples of that is um, actually I, I mentioned earlier, which is Herceptin. Um, Herceptin is a targeted therapy which is designed to specifically um, address uh, the kinds of, of tumors that overexpress this particular protein called EGFR.